Uh, Chairman Smith, esteemed members of the Council and fellow guests of this committee, I'm privileged to testify before you today on the developments of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa and Samaritan's Purse experience and response there. I'm going to read this first page so I don't overlook any of the things that I really want to say, and then I'm going to put the script away, and I'm going to say the things that I feel like need to be said. Samaritan's Purse is an international NGO with 38 years of experience dedicated to humanitarian relief. We've worked in over 100 countries, including Afghanistan, North Korea, South Sudan, Sudan, Syria, and Liberia. As an organization, we have responded to medical emergencies such as the cholera epidemic in Haiti, and we have provided medical care to the people of Bosnia, Rwanda, and Sudan during the genocides in those countries. The Ebola outbreak has had a profound impact on our organization, and I would like to share with you about our experience in Liberia. I want to take this opportunity to thank the United States government, particularly the Department of State, the Department of Defense, for assisting Samaritan's Purse in the evacuation of our sick personnel from Liberia. We could not have done it without them. And we'd especially like to call to attention and thank Kathleen Austin Ferguson of the Department of State, Dr. William Walters of the Department of State, Phil Scotty of the State Department, Mr. Dent Thompson and Congressman Wolf, and yourself. We would also like to thank certain staff members of the CDC and the National Institute of Health for bringing to our attention and obtaining the experimental medication as a treatment option for our two infected staff members. As an organization, we have worked to contain the growing Ebola crisis in Liberia, and we were devastated to discover that two of our personnel had contracted the deadly virus while trying to assist others. The support that the U.S. government has shown to our organization is tremendous, and Samaritan's Purse thanks you for helping us bring the two of them home in the face of incredible challenges. The Ebola crisis was not a surprise to us at Samaritan's Purse. We saw it coming back in April. Our dep epidemiologists predicted it. Uh, by uh, the middle of June, I was having private conversations with senior government leaders, and by July, I was writing editorials in the New York Times saying that this was out of control. Uh, in the 32 years since the disease was discovered, as I believe Dr. Frieden said a moment ago, there were a total of 2,232 known infections, which killed 1,503 people. Easily, this present outbreak is going to surpass that in fatalities as well as overall cases. It is clear to say that the disease is uncontained and it is out of control in West Africa. The international response to the disease has been a failure. And it is important to understand that. A broader coordinated intervention of the international community is the only thing that will slow the size and the speed of the disease. Currently, WHO is reporting 1,711 Ebola diagnosis and 932 deaths in West Africa. Our epidemiologists and medical personnel believe that these numbers represent 25 to 50 percent of what is happening. The ministries of health in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone simply do not have the capacity to handle the crisis in their countries. If a mechanism is not found to create an acceptable paradigm for the international community to become directly involved, then the world will be effectively relegating the containment of this disease that threatens Africa and other countries to three of the poorest nations in the world. I know that a part of community and development philosophy is to work with your local partner and build the capacity. The capacity that is needed in the nations that are fighting Ebola should have been built three to five years ago. But in the times of crisis, I believe that the attention needs to be put on the crisis and the building of the capacity should be a secondary function. We undertook a massive public awareness campaign in Liberia starting in April, and we have had over 435,000 people go through that training. But there are 3.6 million people there, and the majority of them are illiterate. It is not going to be easy to change the way that people think and what their cultural uh, mores are. 
In the first months, we were able to provide support to the World Health Organization, the CDC, the Ministry of Health, and Doctors Without Borders, also known as MSF, with our two aircraft, the only two aircraft in Monrovia, in Liberia, that were flying support. We flew personnel, supplies, and specimens back and forth the across the country. It makes the difference from the triangulation area that Dr. Frieden was talking about, also known as FOIA, to Monrovia. It reduces it from a 16-hour road trip to a 40-minute helicopter flight. I do want to take this moment to recognize and thank our co-workers and Doctors Without Borders for standing in the trenches with us. They are still in Sierra Leone, they are in Guinea, and they are now filling the gap for us in Liberia as we have had to pull back while we replan what we are going to do next. If there was any one thing that needed to demonstrate a lack of attention of the international community on this crisis, which has now become an epidemic. It was the fact that the international community was comfortable in allowing two relief agencies to provide all of the clinical care for the Ebola victims in three countries. Two relief agencies. Samaritan's Purse and Doctors Without Borders. It was not until July the 26th when Kent Brantley and Nancy Reitbull were confirmed positive that the world sat up and paid attention. Today, we're seeing headlines every day of Ebola fears. There is a man who has bled to death evidently in Saudi Arabia and the Saudi government has confirmed it was a hemorrhagic fever and he came from Sierra Leone. There was a man, a Liberian American, who came to Elwa Hospital with one of the most prominent physicians in Liberia, and that physician openly mocked the existence of Ebola. He tried to go into our isolation ward with no gloves, no protective gear. It's not an issue of gloves and a mask. It's an issue of no millimeter of your skin can be exposed or you will get sick and most likely die. That is sort of the reality of it. Those two men left our hospital. They went to the JFK hospital in downtown, downtown Monrovia where the doctor did examine Ebola patients and he was dead four days later. The other man was dead five days later but not before he went to Nigeria and now there are cases of death from Ebola in Nigeria and there are eight more people in isolation. Our epidemiologists believe that what we are going to see is a spike in the disease in Nigeria and then it will go quiet for about three weeks and when it comes out, it will come out with a fury. As I'm talking to you today, we are making preparations for a hospital that we support 263 miles north of Lagos on what they are going to do when Ebola comes to them. To fight Ebola, I've identified four levels of society that need intensive instruction because they simply do not understand what's going on. One is the general public. The custom that they have of venerating the dead by washing the body, I'm going to be graphic because I think people need to know, a part of that is kissing the corpse. In the hours after death with Ebola, that is when the body is the most infectious because the body is loaded with the virus. Everybody that touches the, course, the corpse is another infection. We have encountered violence against us on numerous occasions by people in the general public when we have gone out at the request of the Ministry of Health to sanitize a body for a proper burial. This is going to be a tough thing to do, so you've got this general awareness in the public and the general public. The number two area that needs to be addressed is community health workers. The entire international community has built a medical system around community health workers, which is, is essentially a moderately educated person who is given a few simple medical supplies, an algorithm chart, if it hurts here, are you passing blood, do you have a temperature, given this color pills, the doctor can talk about this more than I, but I think generally I'm getting this right. They do not have the information to understand what Ebola is. Friday, three weeks ago, this Friday, at Elba, we had 12 patients with Ebola present. Eight of them were community health workers. Every one of those health workers 
had seen a patient, had diagnosed them for whatever they thought they had, and then they saw other patients. We have no way of knowing how many other people they have come in contact with. The third level of society is actually medical professionals. Something needs to be done with a focused attention on medical professionals because when I hear reports that prominent physicians who are educated and credentialed and respected deny the disease, I think they need a little bit more education. And then the fourth level is leadership and politics, academics, and religion. I don't know how to make those things happen, but those are the four stratas that I see to turn the disease back. I think the entire fight on the disease has to be focused on containment. To contain it means you need to identify it. The, the previous panel up here was saying that it could be contained, that we have the information. Okay. Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea are poor. Like all countries, they have their problems with pointless bureaucracy, dysfunction, and corruption. I know for a fact that in FOIA, the second largest center where Ebola is manifesting in Liberia, the workers at the Ministry of Health Clinic were not paid for five months even after the European Union had put money forward. The money just didn't get downstream. Again, I will say that Ebola is out of control in West Africa, and we are starting to see panic now around the world. People want to know. I don't know about you folks. I look at the Drudge Report. It can drive a lot of panic. And, uh, you know, there's a guy in New York. There's a woman in England. There's six people have been tested in the United States. Uh, there are reports that there are 340 uh, Peace Corps workers coming back. I greatly appreciate the help of the CDC. They have, in fact, Dr. Frieden and I personally have spoken, and they have, in fact, helped uh, articulate their procedures and protocols for Americans returning into this country. And uh, we are grateful for that. While our Liberian office remains open doing public awareness campaigns, we have, in fact, suspended all other program activity. I would say that we are in the process right now of backing up, replanning, and reloading. We intend to come back and we intend to fight the disease more, but we have found some things that are needed. One of the things that I recognized during the evacuation of our staff is that there is only one airplane in the world with one chamber to carry a level four pathogenic disease victim. That plane is in the United States. There is no other aircraft in the world that I can find. That means that the United States does not have the capacity to evacuate its citizens back in any significant mass, other than unless the military or the, um, uh, the Defense Department has something, DOD has something that I'm not aware of. It was not hard, I mean, it was not easy to get the plane back, but one thing that is important is if the United States, and I believe the United States is going to have to take the lead on this, it may not be popular for us to take the lead today, but I think that we need to take the lead. If we are going to expect people, including the CDC people, to go abroad and put their life on the line, there has to be some assurance that we are able to care for them if they are sick. That may be a regional health care facility that is exclusive to those citizens and those workers, or that may be a demonstrated capacity to get them home. But one airplane with one chamber to get them back is a bit of a slow process. Um, lastly, I think I want to say it is a, um, a, a necessary thing that more laboratories be set up just in Liberia. Uh, the one laboratory now is at JFK Air uh, Hospital. There is another one up at, uh, over in Guinea and Gekadu, and it can take us sometimes 30 hours to get a sample back. I have had discussion with the CDC about this. I think that's under consideration, but I would ask you if you could lean into that and question that, that would be very helpful. The problem is if you have six people that come in and three of them or four of them are suspected, you have to put them in a semi-quarantine area and you're holding that area of your case management center until you get a positive or negative back on them and it takes time. I understand that the World Bank has just committed $200 million to fight the disease. That's fine. That's good. It's a little late. It's good. As somebody with 20 years, 26 years of experience, including being the director of OFDA, 
running many darts around the world, interacting with governments on multiple levels, I have some practical questions. I would like to know where the money will go. I'd like to know what it will actually produce. And I would like to know what it will actually buy. I fear that money alone cannot solve this problem. I disagree with earlier testimony that there is PPE in Liberia. That is inaccurate. I have an email that I've just received in the last 90 minutes from our hospital, the hospital, that, the SIM hospital at Elwa. They're asking us for more personal protection gear. Uh, th this is a, a problem everywhere. I'm in touch daily with the uh, headquarters of MSF in um, Brussels. We're working hand in glove. I appreciate them so much for the way that they are stepping in and fighting this. The biggest challenge that we all have is the logistical support to get the materials and the supplies on the ground to fight this disease. As one of you quoted something that I said earlier, if we do not fight and contain this disease in West Africa, we will be fighting this disease and containing it in multiple other countries around the world. And the truth is, the cat is most likely already out of the bag. I want to thank my staff uh, and recognize them for who have been there and have done a valiant job at great risk to their own lives. I want to let you know that the reintegration back into their country is awkward. People are afraid to get around them. Their husbands and their wives don't know if it's safe to hug them. Their communities may ostracize them. We are doing everything that we can in a staff care uh, way to give them a safe place to be, to protect their privacy. But I just want you to know how difficult it is for American citizens, and in fact, citizens of all countries. We have people on that team that came from more than six countries, maybe seven countries. They all suffer these issues. I believe that this is a very nasty, bloody disease. I could give you descriptions of people dying that you cannot even believe. But I think that we have to fight this disease. We have to fight it now. We're going to fight it here or we're going to fight it somewhere else. I'm talking about here in West Africa, but I do believe that an international coordinated response, something significantly more is needed. Thank you.